Hello and welcome to the online pediatric hematology lecture. The objectives for this lecture are as follows. Compare and contrast the various forms of anemia from a diagnostic perspective. Describe the pathophysiology of various forms of anemia as they relate to red blood cell anatomy and physiology. Discuss interventions associated with the management of various forms of anemia. Discuss the pathophysiology, manifestations, diagnosis, and management of coagulopathies. And finally, apply hematology didactic to real-world examples of anemic patients. Anemia is defined as an abnormality in red blood cells due to a decrease in production or a loss of red blood cells resulting in a decrease in hemoglobin and hematocrit. So every form of anemia will present with a decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit. Just as a refresher, the red blood cell has a biconcave shape to it, allowing for flexibility through blood vessels. Inside the red blood cell are hemoglobin molecules. These are made up of both alpha and beta chains that have heme molecules at the ends with iron bound to it. Each hemoglobin molecule has four heme and iron components that allows for four binding sites for oxygen. The various forms of anemia interfere with some of these structures within the hemoglobin molecule. You may recognize that the alpha and beta polypeptide chains form a quaternary structure in protein folding. This makes the hemoglobin molecule relatively unstable, and you'll notice through some of the anemias that this structure comes unwound. The flow of this lecture is based on this conceptual algorithm where we begin with a low hemoglobin and hematocrit, and then look at a CBC and reticulocyte count. From there, as a component of the CBC, the mean corpuscular volume tells us what the size of the red blood cell looks like. A mean corpuscular volume that's less than 80 is a microcytic cell. One that's between 80 and 100 is a normocytic cell. And those that are greater than 100 are macrocytic. This algorithm will offer a quick method for identifying the different types of anemia in practice. Regardless of the type of anemia, the pathogenesis leads to the same result. Because there's some form of abnormality that interferes with the hemoglobin's ability to bind oxygen, there's going to be a decrease in oxygen availability in peripheral tissues. Therefore, ineffective tissue perfusion results. Also, regardless of the type of anemia, some of the manifestations are very similar. All anemic patients will have fatigue, weakness, dyspnea, pallor, and growth in cognitive delay. We'll begin by discussing the microcytic anemias. These are the forms of anemias with a mean corpuscular volume less than 80. Iron deficiency anemia is likely the most common. It's a microcytic hypochromic anemia. This can result from pregnancy, menorrhagia, hemodialysis, NSAID use, a vegan diet, or GI malabsorptive diseases. Iron deficiency anemia results in impaired heme synthesis in the mitochondria. In this image, I've shown the steps to heme synthesis within the mitochondria. Primarily, I want you to notice that iron is involved in this last step in converting protoporphyrin-9 under the influence of ferrochelatase into heme. Without iron, this last step cannot occur and heme will not be synthesized. In the labs, you'll notice a low hemoglobin and hematocrit, as with all anemias, a low reticulocyte count, a low iron and ferritin, and a high total iron binding capacity, or TIBC. In this image, I have a small demonstration of what each of these components are. Ferritin is the storage for iron. Transferrin is the transfer molecule 
and iron, of course, is the substance. Total iron binding capacity refers to the ability of iron to bind with transferrin to go to iron stores. The management of iron deficiency anemia is pretty straightforward. Give the patient iron. There's a variety of non-pharmacological methods through food. However, patients may also receive iron tablets based on the severity of the disease. Taking vitamin C with iron will increase its absorption. And because iron increases the risk of constipation, You'll want to encourage the patient to increase their intake of fiber and fluids. You'll also want to instruct the patient to avoid greater than 24 ounces a day of cow milk and limit fast food consumption as these impair iron absorption. Thalassemia is an autosomal recessive abnormality of the alpha or beta hemoglobin chains, resulting in a microcytic hypochromic anemia. This is most common in the African, Caribbean, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and Mediterranean populations. Because there's an abnormality in the alpha or beta hemoglobin chain, red blood cells form a characteristic target cell, as noted in this image here. This relates back to the protein conformational structure. This particular conformational change produces weak cells that are sequestered by the spleen and destroyed resulting in jaundice, icterus, and hepatosplenomegaly. A complication of thalassemia is hemosiderosis. This is an excessive supply of iron. This often results in a manifestation referred to as frontal bossing, shown in this image down below. These patients will present with a low hemoglobin and hematocrit, low reticulocyte count, and the peripheral blood smear will show target cells. Because there's an abnormality in the alpha or beta chain, there are less heme molecules and therefore less binding of iron. So the iron and ferritin in these cases may be normal or increased, resulting in the hemosiderosis. Hemosiderosis, as I mentioned, is an excessive iron supply. This excessive iron supply is deposited in body tissues, resulting in bronze pigmentation of the skin, bony changes, and altered organ function. This slide in the top right corner is showing liver tissue, and within it you can see the brown deposits of iron within it. For thalassemia, you want to monitor the hemoglobin and hematocrit trends, as well as the iron levels. These patients may require packed red blood cell transfusions. However, iron levels should be monitored closely during transfusion. Iron chelation therapy with d may be necessary. This is often considered when the ferritin is greater than 800 nanograms per milliliter. This medication is dissolved in juice or water and taken daily. And essentially, with this therapy, it binds iron and allows for secretion through stool. In addition, you'll want to instruct these patients to avoid excessive iron in the diet. Lead poisoning interferes with enzymes in the mitochondria associated with the synthesis of heme. This results in a microcytic hypochromic anemia. Risk factors include the following paint and homes built before 1978, gas exposure prior to 1996, glazed pottery, stained glass products, having a lead pipe water supply, work with batteries or cable, and old painted toys or furniture. Lead poisoning is often manifested by behavioral problems such as irritability and hyperactivity, as well as abdominal pain. In the lab work, you'll see a decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit, a decreased reticulocyte count, and an elevated lead level. In the management of lead poisoning, prevention is critical. Removing old paint is the best way to eliminate sources of lead. You'll want to educate family on the prevention of exposure 
To do this, refer back to the risk factors. These patients may require chelation therapy. If they're on this, you'll want to ensure adequate fluid intake and monitor intake and output. Now we'll discuss normocytic anemias, which involve normal-sized cells. Aplastic anemia is a normocytic and sometimes microcytic anemia due to the failure of bone marrow to produce red blood cells due to either a congenital bone marrow failure or an acquired condition. Aplastic anemia is manifested by epistaxis, gingival oozing, menorrhagia, ecchymosis, petechiae, purpura, oral ulceration, and GI bleeds. I provided this busy image of blood cell development to demonstrate to you that because this is a bone marrow problem, you will notice a decrease in all blood cells as well as platelets resulting in pancytopenia. You'll also find a decreased reticulocyte count, guaiac positive stools, and hematuria. The diagnosis is confirmed by a biopsy that shows hypocellular bone marrow without abnormalities. These abnormalities, just for your information, include dysplasia, blasts, fibrosis, or other abnormal infiltrates. The management of aplastic anemia includes hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, or alternatively, patients can receive immunosuppressive therapy or high-dose cyclophosphamide. These patients may also receive irradiated and leukocyte depleted packed red blood cells or platelets. It's important to provide patient safety to avoid hemorrhage as this population is at risk for bleeding. Stool softeners, in addition, prevent GI irritation, reducing the risk of a GI bleed. Sickle cell anemia is an inherited hemoglobinopathy resulting from a point mutation that produces an abnormal morphology of the hemoglobin A molecule, which converts to a hemoglobin S molecule. In the presence of stressors or trauma, such as infection, fever, dehydration, hypoxia, cold exposure, or physical exertion, these cells demonstrate their sickle shape and increase the viscosity of blood. These sickle cells stick within vessels and result in ischemia. This produces something referred to as a vaso-occlusive pain crisis. And examples of these include cerebrovascular accidents, sepsis, acute chest pain syndrome, reduced visual acuity, splenic sequestration, ulcers, and joint pain. Newborn screening for sickle cell anemia is required in all 50 states. In the labs, you'll find a decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit, an increased reticulocyte count, and in the smear, you'll see sickle cells as well as target cells. In the management of an acute crisis, You'll want to titrate oxygen to an oxygen saturation of greater than 92%. The patient will require a lot of IV fluids for the goal of hemodilution. This is often 150 milliliters per kilogram per day. Patients may also require packed red blood cells. And the resulting hyperkalemia from hemolysis may need to be treated. Antibiotics are required if an infection is present, and these patients will also require some strong pain medication. You'll want to educate patients on reducing risk factors for crises and also prevent infection. Glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency is an X-linked recessive disorder characterized by red blood cell hemolysis 
after exposure to oxidative drugs such as aspirin, sulfonamides, nitrofurantoin, dapsone, fava beans, or infection. This condition results in a normocytic anemia and is most common in the African, Mediterranean, and Asian populations. The labs will reveal a decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit, an increased reticulocyte count, an elevated bilirubin and lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH, which demonstrates destruction, as well as a decreased haptoglobin, which demonstrates intravascular hemolysis. The smear will show bite cells, which are cells that look like they had a bite taken out of them. Complications include neonatal jaundice and life-threatening hemolysis. In the management of G6PD deficiency, you'll want to avoid or eliminate oxidative stress. Folic acid 5 mg PO daily may increase red blood cell production. Otherwise, the management is based on symptoms. They may require oxygen or packed red blood cells. Anemia of chronic disease is a normocytic anemia due to an underlying inflammatory condition. I've listed a variety of examples here, but note that this is a very common disease in the acute care setting. In the labs, you'll notice a decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit, an elevated reticulocyte count, likely elevated white blood cells, a decreased iron, an increased ferritin, and a decreased TIBC. This is a little bit different than your iron deficiency anemia. Because of the inflammation, you have a reduced transport of iron. Therefore, you'll have a lower TIBC. You'll also note an elevated C-reactive protein or erythrocyte sedimentation rate. These are general inflammatory markers. The management involves targeting the underlying disease erythropoietin for chronic kidney disease, packed red blood cells, and iron supplementation. Now we'll discuss a few macrocytic anemias. These anemias present with a low hemoglobin and hematocrit and a mean corpuscular volume greater than 100. Pernicious anemia, or B12 deficiency, is a macrocytic anemia that's an intrinsic problem related to intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is associated with the gastric parietal cells, so you could imagine any damage to the GI mucosa may result in a decrease in intrinsic factor, therefore resulting in B12 deficiency. Risk factors include an age greater than 65 years old, gastric surgery, vegan diet, metformin, or H2 blockers, or proton pump inhibitors. In addition to the normal anemia symptoms, patients with pernicious anemia present with neurological symptoms, such as neuropathy, a positive Romberg test, ataxia, cognitive impairment, in addition to glossitis, which is inflammation of the tongue, and angular stomatitis, which is ulceration on the sides of the mouth. These patients will have a decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit, a reduced reticulocyte count, and a decreased B12 level. Treatment is obviously to give them B12. You can give them 1,000 milligrams daily by mouth, or you can give them 1,000 milligrams once IM a month. The reason you can split this into monthly IM injections is because it bypasses the GI tract. Therefore, you don't have to worry about intrinsic factor. Folic acid deficiency anemia is a macrocytic anemia that's an extrinsic problem due to inadequate intake. Not only is folic acid necessary for red blood cell production, but it's also important in neural tube formation. Folic acid deficiency during pregnancy may result in spina bifida and encephaly. 
Risk factors include an age greater than 65 years old, pregnancy or lactation, GI malabsorptive disease, methotrexate, infant intake of goat milk, or anticonvulsives. Unlike pernicious anemia, folic acid deficiency anemia has no neurological symptoms. However, you will still see glossitis or angular stomatitis. The lab work looks very similar, but there's a decreased folic acid level instead of a low B12 level. The treatment is folic acid replacement, and the dose is often 1 mg PO daily. In this final section, we'll cover coagulopathies. Idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, or ITP, is an autoimmune destruction of platelets by antiplatelet antibodies. This results in excessive bleeding, petechiae, or pinpoint hemorrhages, and purpura, which are large areas of hemorrhage under the skin. They're often purple, but they can also present as these small red patches on the skin. This often develops one to four weeks after a viral infection. It's most common in young children with spontaneous recovery later. In the labs, the hemoglobin and hematocrit are normal unless there's a hemorrhage and white blood cells are normal. However, you'll notice a platelet count less than 50,000. If platelets drop below 20,000, corticosteroids, either prednisone or prednisolone and IVIG as well as platelet transfusion may be needed. If ITP persists for greater than one year, a splenectomy may be considered. A splenectomy is considered in this case because platelets are sequestered by the spleen, resulting in destruction. You'll want to instruct patients to avoid NSAIDs, aspirin, and antihistamines due to the risk for anemia. Instead, use acetaminophen for pain control. You'll also want to advise patients to avoid strenuous or rough activities and encourage swimming as an alternative. Hinoch schonlein purpura is a systemic vasculitis with IgA-dominant immune deposits that affect microvasculature. This often occurs in the skin, gut, and kidneys, as demonstrated by the image I provided. This condition is often benign with a good prognosis, even though it looks kind of rough. It's hypothesized to be associated with infection, drugs, and toxins. A potential complication of this condition is nephrotic syndrome, which results in acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease, resulting in chronic hypertension. To diagnose this condition, a biopsy of affected organs demonstrates IgA deposition. There's no specific treatment. However, corticosteroids may be used in patients with persistent symptoms, as this is an autoimmune condition. Additionally, renal dysfunction must be managed. Disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, or DIC, is essentially a battle between coagulation and anticoagulation. This can be triggered by septic shock, endotoxins, viri, tissue necrosis or injury, or cancer treatment. In this image, I show how sepsis recruits monocytes, which results in fibrin deposition as well as the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which activates endothelial cells, resulting in impairment of anticoagulant mechanisms, as well as insufficient removal of fibrin depositions. This results in the development of microvascular thrombi, which can decrease tissue perfusion once they clump up in a vessel. However, in addition to these small thrombi, the patient's blood is actually very thin and hemorrhage and organ tissue damage can result if it's not readily identified. 
So on these two extremes, anticoagulation results in bleeding, and you'll see petechiae, purpura, hematuria, hematochesia, and oozing from venipuncture sites or umbilical cords. In practice, I've actually seen patients bleed from their gums, eyes, and ears as a result of DIC. And I've heard of cases where patients will actually bleed through their pores in their skin. On the other hand, coagulation resulting in those microthrombi results in decreased oxygenation, circulatory collapse, presenting as poor perfusion, tachycardia, prolonged capillary refill, and weak distal pulses, as well as a decreased urinary output, or UOP. Here I simplified laboratory findings. These are the key things that you'll notice. A decrease in platelets, a prolongation of the PT or PTT, a decrease in fibrinogen, and an increase in fibrin split products and a D-dimer. This results from fibrin breakdown. In DIC management, it's key to target the underlying cause, for example, antibiotics for an underlying infection that produced sepsis. You'll want to stop all coagulation. And heparin, although it's controversial, may counteract the deficiency in the coagulation-anticoagulation pathway and reduce the consumption of platelets. You'll want to apply pressure or cold compresses to the bleed site and elevate bleeding extremities. These patients may require clotting factors, platelets, and cryoprecipitate to prevent hemorrhage. Hemophilia is an X-linked recessive disorder resulting in a deficiency of one of the coagulation factors. It's diagnosed by conducting an assay of factor levels. And in the management, you'll want to prevent bleeding by avoiding activities with a high risk of injury and administer coagulation factors. This should be done only if bleeding occurs or prior to surgery. Von Willebrand disease, or VWD, is the most common inherited bleeding disorder. Von Willebrand factor acts as a carrier protein for factor VIII in plasma. It also helps with platelet aggregation and adhesion to damaged endothelium. It's manifested as epistaxis, easy bruising or bleeding after oral surgery, and menorrhagia. The management is similar to hemophilia. You'll want to prevent injury or bleeding. If there is a bleed or an injury, it's important to administer von Willenbrand factor. Desmopressin, or DDAVP, raises the plasma level of von Willenbrand factor from stores, in the endothel from stores in the endothelium of blood vessels. This essentially releases factor VIII and von Willenbrand factor from these stores. This may be done prior to surgery or dental work to prevent a bleed.